Okay, right. So, hello everybody. Uh, it's Tom from PBR TV. We are doing our second episode of our live streaming sessions uh, on our Facebook, but we're also um, simultaneously streaming to our YouTube and our LinkedIn pages as well. This week, um, Paul and I are going through boat safety. Um, last week, um, Paul Glatzel, obviously, who's an RWA instructor, we went through um, our sort of introduction into boat training, um, the roles of a skipper, um, the different sort of uh, uh, training that is out there. Um, but, but this week, we're going to delve a little bit deeper into the uh, boat safety elements. So we're going to look at uh, life jackets and um, kill cords and various different items of your sort of grab bag or, or safety kit that you should be having on board. So, uh, Paul, thanks for joining us today again for uh, another episode. No, it's a pleasure. Thanks. Um, I think it's really important that obviously the government has announced uh, ways of sort of easing lockdown and um, over the next couple of weeks, people are obviously going to be probably boating a lot more than they have been during um, full lockdown. Um, so I think this is the, the right time to be able to remind everybody of some safety tips and, and items that they should have on board their boat. Um, Absolutely. I think I think the coming weekend, and particularly next week or two, running into bank holiday is going to be busy across the country. Appreciate not necessarily maybe so much in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, but, but certainly in England, it's, it's looking like it's going to be busy. Yeah, definitely. Okay, cool. So um, to start things off, I suppose the the the, the sort of most common uh, item of kit on board a boat that people should be wearing is obviously uh, life jackets and buoyancy aids. So why should people be wearing these, and what's the differences maybe between the two of them? Yeah, good question. Uh, it's interesting. It has changed a lot since I started. Uh, instructing and, and certainly over the last five ten years when you're out and about now you see far more people wearing life jackets and buoyancy aids than, than was the case previously um, and I think the way you've got to look at them is it's an insurance policy and we're going to come on to kill cords I know shortly but um, we all have in place in life various insurance policies um, and a life jacket is another such insurance policy um, we don't expect to fall in the foot water um, we don't want to but if we do uh, we need the support that a life jacket or buoyancy aid gives because um, naturally we float low in the water. Um, the water will be somewhere near our mouth. The danger is we ingest approximately one and a half litres of water um, and we die. Um, so having a life jacket raises you up, um, gets your airway clear of the water and, and a, a proper life jacket should uh, right an unconscious casualty who's face down in the water and maintain their airway. So I've got one down here that I'll just get up. So quite a lot of different life jackets um, around uh, through from uh, quite um, sort of at the cheaper end of the market. So this is about um, £55 through to a couple of hundred pounds you can pay. Um, and there's um, like, like anything, to a certain extent, you get what you pay for um, in terms of, sort of quality and features. But ultimately, they all do the same thing. They all have to, have to meet a certain standard. Uh, to be able to be certified as a life jacket. Um, and what you've probably seen out there is you've got gas inflation life jackets like this one, um, and then you've got permanent buoyancy life jackets, generally the big orange ones. Um, and you've got to make a decision as a skipper what the, what you give to people on your boat. And a general rule of thumb is um, if you're going to give a gas life jacket to someone, they need to be competent enough to be able to self-inflate it in the water. You get manual ones where you have to pull the toggle or you get automatic ones where there's a little sort of paper cartridge inside that goes all sort of mushy in water and then sets the life jacket off if you fall in. My strong recommendation would be, unless you've got any particular reason to go into the water, and I can't see really that leisure boaters have got that reason, always get an automatic one. They don't go off accidentally. That's a, a real fallacy. It was the case years and years ago, but they don't really nowadays. Um, and if you fall in and you bang your head, you want it to go off automatically for you. So we did say we'd actually just give it, uh, give it a try. It's easier when you've got it on uh, yourself. Um, so yeah, can you, can you show, us, show us some of those features and obviously yeah, how to wear it correctly and and yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's like a, like a jacket basically, um, and it's got um, um, a, basically a buckle at the front. We undo it, put it on as a jacket, and this one hasn't been set to uh, to the right size before, so I'm not probably going to be able to do that um, on on camera. 
and then you bring it round, set it to the right sort of size, um, do it up at the front, and then you've got your crotch strap to go on uh, down between your thighs. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, we see the different styles. So you've got um, sort of spin lockers that really nicely fitted uh, to the sort of I call it the designer end of the life jacket uh, realm. Um, but they all sort of operate in a pretty much similar way, don't they? Yeah, absolutely. So you've got here on this one, you've got a little toggle, which is your your manual override, um, and then. This one's quite easy to get into because it's Velcro, and we've got the, the automatic elements of it in here, which detects the water, um, and will push a firing pin up into the cylinder that's just here. And we need to make sure, as a regular check, we just check that the cylinder's nice and tight, um, and the auto head's nice and tight, and it's in date. So if you get your life jacket serviced every year, take it to a Chandler's, they'll sort that for you. And if the um, automatic system, um for whatever reason fails, you've still got the pull cord, haven't you, to manage Yeah, that. absolutely. So you've got the pull cord here. Uh, we've got a little green toggle that you might be able to see, a little uh, green mark there that actually shows that this hasn't previously been pulled. Um, but if we pull this, then that will push the firing pin up and put the gas into the bladder. Yeah, okay, great stuff. Um, so, uh, well, do you, do you want to show a life jacket going off? I suppose. Yeah, so without, putting it, without putting it on, we're just going to set this one off and, and you can see how it goes. Hopefully, uh, hopefully it should work fine. So we pull it. Yeah, so it's instantaneous, isn't it, for people that may have not yeah. done that before? So that's coming really quick. It's really cold uh, because of the gas going into it. And it might be, if your head's through here, it's actually a little tight uh, around. So on this side, uh, we've got the ability to just take some air out or to put some air in. Um, if it's not inflated enough. We've got um, a whistle on this side. Um, if you've got any chance of going out at night on your boat, generally don't do it unless you've been uh, trained, given some advice as to how to do it. But there would be a light attached to either the uh, inflation tube here or elsewhere in the life jacket. Um, and that would flash, generally speaking, one, one that flashes automatically on contact with water. So if you fell in at night, it would be flashing away. And the, and the more offshore um, orientated uh, life jackets from the big manufacturers all have a, a spray hood as well, don't they, that's included in that to, to help. Why, why would a spray hood be uh, important to somebody? Well, when you're in the water, uh, your feet naturally anchor, uh, act as an anchor. So uh, if you're in the water for any time, you'll naturally turn around so you're head to wind. And therefore, any spray has the chance of coming into your mouth and you ingesting that. And as I said earlier, there's danger if you ingest water into your lungs, then you drown. Uh, so the spray hood is a brilliant way, bring it down over your head, um, and then that water's kept away from your airways. Um, really great course to do, uh, the RYC survival course. One day, a uh, couple of hours in a swimming pool, learning all this sort of stuff, and you go in the pool with a life jacket on, you learn about spray hoods, you get in and out of a life raft. It's a really, really valuable use of, of a day. Yeah, I found that I, I had to do sea survival courses. Um, I used to when I was uh, racing powerboats, and uh, it's uh, an invaluable course. Even if you spend a lifetime boating, um, uh, there's there's always points that you can bring out and and hone on your your sea safety skills. Um, so we've we've gone through obviously the, the sort of different manufacturers and different um, uh, styles of life jacket. Obviously, um, when we chatted about doing this uh, live stream, we were talking about the fact that it's really important to pop on a life jacket, try it out before you buy it. What's your thoughts on, what's your thought on this? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I know we all buy stuff on the internet nowadays, uh, but generally speaking, if you want to buy a nice jacket, you go to the shop and you try it on. And, and it should be the same with the life jacket. And, and if you go and you try on a life jacket, not all bodies are the same, not all life jackets are the same. And you'll find that there are some life jackets that just fit you better. And if it fits you better, then you won't notice it and you won't be ill at ease wearing it and therefore you'll just carry on wearing it and not even think about it. There's a lot of people, some of the initial reactions I get about life, oh, it's going to get in the way and it's rubbing me. Well, that's if a well-fitted life jacket, just that won't be the case. And actually, 99% of the time, people don't even realise they're wearing it once they've got it on. And that's, that's the trick, um, is get it on, get wearing it, because generally speaking, if something goes wrong, um, the last thing you want to have to do is faff around trying to actually find the life jacket and get the life jacket on. If it's on the whole time, and particularly if you fall into the water, um, then you know it's there for you when you need it. Yeah, uh, and I think also from a buying tip, there are obviously 
um, different features of styles of life jackets. So um, ones that have um, got the spray hood and the more sort of a, a commercially offshore environment um, life jacket. But they've also got different newton meter ratings of buoyancy. Can you sort of talk me through that? Because there are obviously yeah, different ratings, but does that mean that the highest newton meter is the, the, the larger gentleman or uh, lady? Or, or um, yeah, it's, how that it's, works? It's a really good question, and it's one of those common sort of misunderstandings. So let, let's take the two most common ones we tend to hear about, are 150 Newton life jackets mm -hmm. and 275 Newton lift ja life jackets. So that's the amount of lift that's given from the life jacket, and it's the standard that they're built to. So you'll get some Crusader, Spinlock, their life jackets will meet the standard that's 150, but they might be giving 180, 190 worth of lift to the person in the water. So what difference does it make? Well, the smallest person in the world and the biggest person in the world, um, when you put them into water, they both float. And we float with our mouths level to the surface of the water. So one of the fallacies is that that amount of lift is not to do with the weight of the person because we're all sort of neutrally buoyant. What the difference is, is if you work in construction or police or you're going offshore and you're carrying more kit, maybe heavier waterproofs, then you're making yourself negatively buoyant. You're, you're putting more weight on your body that will just sink to the bottom. So therefore, you need more lift to counter that. So a 150 Newton life jacket um, or the one slightly above that from some manufacturers are perfect in, in most situations. But if you're going to be wearing, say, in a police situation, firearms, cuffs, radios, and so on. All of that is potentially pushing you towards the bottom. So you need something to counter it the other way. Um, and that's really why you have the 275 and the 150. It's to counter that extra weight, not in their person, but around their person they might be carrying. Yeah. I, I would say also um, the next big thing, obviously, uh, voting is a, a family affair. What would you recommend for children? I know for, for Teddy, who's um uh, three and a half growing rapidly he's gone through already uh two different types of uh life jacket um and he can be a, a a weird stage in his life where neither really fit him too particularly great so can you yeah talk through sort of parents of you know practical safety tips for for their children on board Yeah, it's a good, good question. The most important thing is to get them wearing something and we, we touched on buoyancy aids and, and life jackets are, uh, as we said, right, an unconscious casualty that's faced down the water. The other end of the spectrum is buoyancy aids. They're effectively foam around your body that gives you some lift, uh, but doesn't right you. It gives you comfort in the water. So with the young kids, the question is, do you get them wearing a life jacket or a buoyancy aid? And in an ideal situation, you probably have them in, a, in their early stages in a foam life jacket. That's what our kids did when they started off. Foam life jackets, the big bit around the neck, they just get used to wearing. It gives you a nice handhold to grab hold of them and lift them up if they're wearing the crotch straps as they should be. Um, and get them wearing it right from the outset so you can get little baby ones and then it just becomes the norm for them to do that. Um, there'll come a point where they're suited to move towards gas inflation. And that it, it, you, it's a real generalisation. You have to look at your own kid on this. Maybe five or six when they're confident swimming in a pool where you figure they could deploy that gas cylinder manually should they need to that would be the stage where they might be suited uh, to a gas inflation life jacket. Chat to a Chandler at some at that stage. But actually, it might well be, um, from a financial point of view, that actually just having them in a buoyancy aid the whole time so they can wear that, get comfortable with it, and then they're jumping in and out of the water and they're swimming around the boat wearing the buoyancy aid, giving them and you greater comfort when they're there. That actually can be a good solution too. I think the most important thing is they wear something and they get used to it. Ideally, a life jacket, but a buoyancy aid is absolutely great too. Yeah, getting them familiar, familiar so as they grow up, they're just constantly wearing the, the jacket and feeling comfortable. And I think a great point there is actually train your kids to train you. Uh, they, they, like you wear your life jacket um, and you make sure you tell daddy and mummy to wear their life jackets too. And then you give them a little job and it gives them a little incentive to wear their life jacket and then they give you a hard time if you forget to put yours in. Yeah. Would you say um, one sort of quick thing that sort of popped into my head um, before we uh, move on to a different uh, subject it, um, is that with life jackets, especially with the, the sort of more offshore environment, but um, a lot of the, especially the ribbing community that may be going off the Channel Islands or whatever and all, all weather boaters that are in a dry suit and stuff, if they're wearing full wet weather gear, um, to Barry boots, a, a dry suit, does that kind of also um, impact on the type of life jacket that they should be buying or, or, or 
where in the, the, the other inheritance are quite buoyant or can weigh you down? Well, they, the dry suit is likely to, to give some buoyancy. Um, the debari is a little bit of weight, but it probably traps some air, so it's probably reasonably neutral um, in terms of something like that. I would say generally for your, your boater that's doing a Channel Islands touch, a normal boater without carrying extra kit, 150 um, equivalent Newton my just life jackets absolutely fine. That's what I wear all the time. I don't wear anything more than a 150 unless you're suddenly starting to go up to, to, to that next level. The thing about the 275 Newtons is they're so big and bulky that they're actually really quite heavy to wear. Um, and the 150, 150 does fine. What you can do is if your life jacket's due a service um, and you're you know, at the beach, um, why not just do what I've done? Get in the water in, in a depth that you're comfortable with so you're able to stand up and just maybe one of you just set the life jacket off and then the others wear it and just see what it's like in the water. And then you can get a feel for how much buoyancy it gives you and then it just goes straight off to the, the chandlers for service. Or be like me and launch your boat and walk into, some, uh, walk into the water from the slipway, forgetting you've got your life jacket off and then let it off anyway. Um, I, think I think we've all done that, Tom. We just managed to keep quiet about it when we do do it. Yeah, exactly. Um, so um, num number two key item of um, uh, safety on board the boat, you're, you're wearing your life jacket, obviously so often forgotten by people, but hopefully by bringing awareness to this, it will really help people be reminded to wear their life jacket. The second one is obviously your kill cord. Um, so can you explain to people, maybe new boaters, why it's important to wear your kill cord and, and some aspects around that, point, pointers and reminders? So the kill cord, this little red uh, curly thing here is a, a kill cord. And basically one engine attaches to a part of the boat, or sorry, one end of the kill cord rather, attaches to part of the boat. Um, and basically when you come out of the boat or away from the, the throttle position, uh, then that pulls the kill cord out and that switches the engine off basically um, and this needs to be attached to you which we'll come back to in a moment um, why should you wear it well i think it really comes back to that insurance policy you know how many people fall out of a boat well not very many um if i'm honest but then you know not too many houses burn down but we all have insurance for fire on our houses and we insure our cars for things that you know don't often happen to us and i think the way to look at it is okay it might never happen but if it does happen, you've put the perfect insurance policy in place. And I think over the years, there have been plenty of experience, uh, plenty of examples of situations where people have fallen out of boats. And then what happens is the boat will circle and the danger is circle back on the person in the water. And there was a video knocking around even just this week from America of uh, uh, sort of an AA equivalent boat in America and the commercial operator in that had fallen out. And there was a big, probably 30 foot uh, yeah, going around in circles taking out up here um so really quite scary experience and there's no way you're going to get away with it if you're there and that propeller's chomping away at you so it's i've seen more than enough photos of that to know it's not something you want to do and some practical things uh with kill cords um that uh yeah recommend that you you test the kill cord every time you go down to the boat yeah it's a great great suggestion and it should be just like you you check all your other stuff on the boat check the kill cord because kill cords can fail in one of two ways. They can fail such that when you pull them out, or sorry, that it just, it fails and it doesn't allow the boat to be started. But actually quite often, um, if they fail, it means that um, when the, the kill cord gets pulled out, the boat carries on running. And I've had that. Uh, we went to do, you know, a level two course for an engine manufacturer, should we say. And the first thing we did was check the kill cord and, and it didn't kill the engine. And that was a manufacturer giving us a boat to do some training for their own staff. Um, it happens. Um, so I've, I've, had it, I, I've had it where um, uh, a particular um, throttle box was designed in a way that the kill cord was integrated into it. And when you uh, pulled the kill cord, um, it allowed um, the engine to be restarted without the kill cord once. The problem was I connected the kill cord thinking it was connected, but actually it was on that second restart. Right. Um, and um, then it, the kill cord didn't uh, turn the engine off when the kill cord was pulled. So there was sort of a little glitch. And I, I think that particular brand of throttle box is, is now obsolete, but these things are important to check, aren't they? I, I, it's not like anything, yeah, for sure. Definitely check it. Start of each day you go flow. Yeah, the, um, there are alternatives to 
the red cord, um, these new sort of electronic wireless kill cords. What, what's your take on those? Because we, um, you know, with all new technology, we've got to be familiar with these things. Yeah, absolutely. And there have been over the last few years quite a few solutions come out of things that you wear around your neck or put in your pocket and the proximity sensors or one that came out which was like the traditional kill cord but it detected whether you were actually wearing it to your person. Um, at the end of the day, um, as long as all these things work, and I'd always go online and you know, they, they can be great inventions, they need to probably um, just bed in with some users that use them and, and therefore go online and just check they are actually working because I don't know which ones necessarily are, are still around. Um, but the key thing is to use it and to use it properly. There's no point in having one of the ones you hang around your neck if you then hang it on the throttle and then you crack on with it on the throttle and you disappear out the back of the boat. It's like these. These need to be worn, but they need to be worn correctly as well. So um, one of the, the mistakes you see people make is to wear them around their wrist. Mm. Um, and the problem with wearing them around the wrist is there's not really anything on your hands that prevents it coming off. Whereas if you wear it around your thigh, that is going to prevent it sliding over your foot. So it, it, it's about, the kill cord's simple and it works. And that costs, an, an OEM one is about 15 quid, not cheap. Uh, but I'd certainly make sure you buy an original manufacturer's part. Uh, because one of the things I only found out a couple of years ago was that these, um, the little clips at the end, sometimes the ones you buy uh, in the chambers that have loads of them, the thickness and the diameter of the hole here, might fit your boat, but because it's not designed and it's maybe the tolerance isn't great because of where it's manufactured, maybe it's just stretching the switch uh, or it's jammed in there too tight. And when you go to pull it, it doesn't pull out. So whether it's electronic or it's manual, just make sure you use it right. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a, a really good point. I'd say on the, the electronic wireless ones as well that um, people really need to sort of uh, check with their engine manufacturer as well before having that rigged and obviously have it rigged by a a professional marine engineer as well. Um, uh, also, it, it, if people find them useful, PBR, we do do our, our own um, stickers for the console, which is just a useful uh, pointer to make sure that you're wearing your kill cord if uh, you can it's easily forgotten if you're out of sync and out of practice with these things. Um, you know, just, just, just to interrupt there, Tom, the, yeah. you've got the perfect kill cord reminder in your household, from what you say. Uh, which is, well, did you say your son was three years old? Yeah. Um, then train him to tell dad to wear the kill cord. And kids are absolutely brilliant because if you give them a job, which is don't let mum or dad drive this boat without wearing that kill cord, they're going to be brilliant at it. Um, and actually it really involves them in the boating as well. Um, yeah. So that that's those stickers that you guys did a few years ago are great. The OA does some within their books. Um, training your children to, to train you is a great way to do it. As well. Yeah, that's really good pointer um so we're wearing the kill cord we're wearing a life jacket we're, we're doing things on board practically to be safe um but something does happen um from time to time so we need to be able to have the right kit on board to then be able to uh, deal with then uh, a distress situation so there are obviously various different ways that we can issue distress and let people know around us that we're in trouble uh, i'd say the, the first one that most people think of is Flares. Can you can you chat to us a, a little bit about flares and the different types and what they're used for? Yeah, so so flares are a means of um, seeking assistance when you're in distress. So uh, certainly, uh, basically, red and orange flares that are going to be more detail in a moment are all about. I'm in distress, which is grave and danger to life. I need assistance. And the great thing about flares is, whilst okay, they're pyrotechnics, um, and we all tell our kids not to set off fireworks. Um, and get too close to them. And then with flares, you do need to, uh, to be holding them uh, when you set them up or uh, deploy them up into the sky. Um, they do, they are effective, and people along the coastline of the UK know what they're looking at. You only need a Chinese lantern to go up or a, a white uh, illumination flare in Pearl Harbor, and the Coast Guard's overrun with calls about flares. Uh, people know what they're looking at, so they're really effective. We, we've got a few different types. Here I've got a handheld red, um, and basically this, as its name suggests, a flare ejects a, um, a chunk of flame out the top, bright red, really, really bright, um, visible probably from about one to two miles would be uh, a reasonable distance to think of. Um, and the thing about these is they burn white hot from the top to the handhold bit here. 
Um, so in terms of what you should do with the flare, read the instructions. And the time to read the instructions is not the time it's all going horribly wrong. You're sinking and you go, wish I had my glasses with me. Uh, so what you should do is you as a skipper need to know how to uh, operate flares, but also why, why would you not ask one or two people on the boat, Tom, you're coming with me today, the flares are in that locker, just get them out, have a look, make sure you know how to deploy them um, and, and put some training in again. So it only needs to take a couple of minutes. And then basically, you need to follow the instructions. Um, if it's something where you pull, like on this one, we take the top off, we've got a little piece of string here, these are dummy flares, I hasten to add, um, and basically hold and push the flare away from you. The instructions actually say sort of pull, but there's a danger of pulling towards your face, so hold and push it um, away from you with the wind on your back, um, because there's loads of crud gonna come out of these. Hold them at a slight angle, um, and you see I haven't got a glove on, but have a gardening glove, welding glove, in the flare box and these will burn uh, for a couple of minutes really bright and you won't be able to look at them um, yes, but they're not really effective you'd be able to use uh, a red handheld for day and night wouldn't you absolutely and that's one of the great things about it um is that they're visible day and night and they're really really bright i suppose um, one that you'd only use uh for daytime use would be uh, an orange smoke distress flare yeah absolutely so we've got um orange smoke and orange smoke as you rightly say, anything smoke related is not going to be visible. And orange smoke has the benefit of being you know, very visible, um, but it doesn't burn hot. You can get floating ones, we can get handheld ones, so they have different longevities in terms of how, they, how long they burn for. Um, if a helicopter's coming to get you, um, it can be helpful for them to see wind direction down around the boat, so deploying that and then seeing the way that the smoke um, is going. Or it might well be you're in a busy boating area and they're struggling to determine uh, which boat they should come to, um, and deploying a smoke uh, can be a good thing. Deploying a rocket in the vicinity of a helicopter tends not to get you rescued because the helicopters don't seem so happy about that. Yeah, that's very true. Um, you've also got a uh, red parachute or, or rocket flares. Um, yeah. What's the difference between what we're talking about and, and these two? Yeah, so here we've got an example of a rocket flare. Um, and there are a couple of different makes uh, around of these. And it, again, it comes down to reading the instructions because some you do something at the bottom and pull it on that one or on uh, this one, you just take the cap off at the bottom and it's then about holding it as the firing pin drops at the bottom you hold and press up. And you basically want to have it angled approximately 15 degrees off the vertical um, downwind and it will come and seek the wind. So it basically shoots up to about 300 meters Parachute deploys, comes down slowly, um, uh, giving you know sort of three to four minutes burn. And the rule of thumb is deploy two. So one, leave it a minute or two, and then another. And the reason for that is if someone sees one, they're going, I'm not sure I should call the Coast Guard, I'm not sure that's a flare. They see another one, they're more sure that it is a flare. So that, that, those are going to be used for more long range distress, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, you read some of the numbers in terms of how far away they say they're visible. And I have to be honest, I'm a bit skeptical. I think on this one, it says something like 30 miles. But the reality is, I think if you budget for sort of five to six miles, uh, then that's about right. But with any of the flares, don't deploy them um, unless you figure you can be seen. There's no point just putting them up in the vague hope that someone sees them. Make sure there's someone there that could see you. Otherwise, you're just wasting the very limited resources you've got to seek attention. Yeah, and I suppose um, uh, you don't want to just be yeah, as you say, just wasting your flares unless you feel that you are in an area or, or could be seen on the horizon. Um, outside of the um, pyrotechnic um, flares, there are LED laser flares that have come on the market. What's your opinion as a ROA instructor and somebody who's very, very experienced in offshore boating on, on these type of technologies? So you've got here a, a laser flare and you deploy this one by just adjusting the bottom um, and they're, they're all slightly different in terms of how they deploy a uh, laser and bright red light basically out the top. Um, they're, they're getting there probably would be my afraid. I think there's a massive advantage in that there's a long battery life on them versus flares which by definition burn out quite quickly. There's the danger potentially inherent in flares versus uh, something like this. Um, the, the ones I've seen during the day are not always particularly visible um, at any great distance and it's not necessarily obvious to someone looking that what they're looking at is a request for assistance. Um, they can be different at night in terms of putting a cone shape 
um, red sort of LED cone up into the sky. I'm slightly skeptical as to whether anyone looks at that and goes, someone's in distress. The thing about flares, pyrotechnic flares, they've been around forever. Um, whereas these things are relatively new and people just don't see them very often because that's like 100 quid. Uh, so it's not that you're going to go, for wrongly, people set flares off when they shouldn't do. But the benefit of that is that people do see what flares actually look like when you see a sailor coming into harbour with two of them. They don't tend to do this. So people have far less awareness of what one of these looks like. I suppose if you've got a fixed red LED as well, somebody could mistake it for a navigation uh, light. Yeah, I mean, it's, the, the one, we, we tested in a different environment one recently, and we had a group of about 30 of us looking at it, and everybody goes, it's just a red light. Um, well, there was no, there was nothing that indicated that that was distress related. So, but they're good. I think, I think what we're probably finding is we've got pyrotechnic flares, and then we've got a solution that is actually good, and it's another tool in the toolbox. But we've got some, as we'll come on to, other means of, electronic means of issuing distress that maybe is where it's going to go. Um, over, for me, I'm still carrying pyrotechnic flares. Um, there is a danger, but I know when the stuff hits the fan, I'm going to be setting those off. Yeah, and um, I suppose when I was growing up boating, uh, Dad was always keen on us having these little uh, mini um, mini rocket flare packs that you put in your dry suit pocket or whatever. But uh, as you say, probably rather than these LEDs or whatever, there are other solutions that you've got to probably a little bit more honed in on your location. Yeah, I mean, those the, the little handheld uh, flares you talk about, the double-ended, orange smoke, one end, red flare, the other can go in a, a pocket. Lifeboat crew um, have one of those each, and they can be a great way of, I'm in the water, here I am. So there's a real you know value to those. Um, whether your money nowadays is better spent on another product um, will come to, no doubt, uh, no doubt later on. Yeah, um, so you've got your, your, uh, your suitable flare pack. They're all in date. Um, but you know you, you've been voting for a little while now. How do you dispose of them when when they do come out date? Uh, in, with increasing difficulty. Um, if you go back quite a few years, um, you can drop them at police stations or lifeboat stations. You can't do that anymore. Um, the bomb squad used to come around and get them, and the bomb squad are somewhat busy over the last 10, 15 years in various other theatres. Um, so basically, now what you need to do is to go onto the MCA, the Maritime Coast Guard Agency website and see where the collection centres are. There's one here in Poole at the RNLI College, but you have to ring up for an appointment, check they've got capacity, take the flares to them. Uh, what I would suggest is um, when you buy your flares, try and buy them from a place that agrees to take the old ones back um, because we're all into recycling nowadays and we appreciate the dangers of just leaving things lying around um, and they are difficult to dispose of. So either through the MCA um, and their allotted points or try and get them back to the manufacturer through a chandler's by purchasing there in the first place. Yeah, okay, good. Um, okay, so then the next thing I would think about um, is your most obvious sort of next step in safety is uh, VHFs. Um, can you tell me what, you know, the difference between, I, I, it seems really um a simple question, but the difference really in practicality of a, a fixed VHF versus a, a handheld and the benefits of both? Yes, yeah, good question. I think it really comes down, there's two two key variables. So a fixed VHF set is one that plugs in, is plumbed into the 12 volt system within your boat. And you have an external aerial um, and it's all there and it's permanent versus a handheld radio um, that as its name suggests is in your hand and you carry it around. Why would you have one versus the other? I think a, re a pretty good rule of thumb would be if your boat's about 20 foot or more, you're probably going to have a fixed set um, you, because you're probably in the realms of having a chart or almost certainly in the realms of having a chart box nowadays. You're going to have somewhere to put an area, whether it's on an A-frame or somewhere around the cockpit area on a, on a hard boat, um, and you've got the 12-volt system that's there permanently. Uh, fixed sets give you greater range generally because it's all about height of aerial. Um, so VHF range is all about line of sight communication and there's a limit to how high you can get a handheld. But if you've got a smaller boat um, and if you're boating in a busier area, so you think somewhere like Paul Harbour where there's literally hundreds or thousands of boats, a handheld is going to give you more than enough range within the confines and immediate approaches to Paul Harbour to get hurt. Um, so it's a mixture of where you boat and what sort of boat you've got. Now in an ideal world, we'd all buy every insurance policy in the world. Uh, so one insurance policy is a 
fixed VHF, another one is a handheld, and another one is another handheld. You know, money is finite for, for everyone. Um, so what you tend to find is people quite often start with a handheld, and then they get a fixed set in their boat, and then they've got the handheld as a backup. Um, and that, that sort of works pretty well. And a fixed set nowadays, good, good icon fixed set, 160 quid, um, waterproof front, really good, great backup and support. And there are lots of manufacturers uh, producing those. Again, you get what you pay for in life. Um, icon handhelds from about 130, 140 through to about I think 250 for, for this one, um, which has DSC in it as well. Yeah, so can you uh, tell us the differences between um, a, a traditional just handheld VHF and one that is uh, DSC enabled? Yeah, so a handheld or any of the radios, if we're going to go to distress, we go to channel 16, there's a button you press, it takes you to 16, and we've all heard Mayday, 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 mm -hmm. uh, which uh, is help you, help you, help you, basically. Uh, what DSC is, is on the back of this radio, you might not be able to see it, there's a little red button and we lift the flap, press the button, um, and that issues our position. Um, it issues an identifying code called an MMSI for the radio. Um, so it tells the Coast Guard where we are. Now, what's beneficial of that over and above voice um, and just doing mayday, mayday, mayday? Well, let's say there's a whole load of boats around here and they've got their radios turned down and maybe they're not on channel 16 and maybe they're down below um, making some dinner when they're anchored up. When we go red button push distress, whether you're on the channel, whether the volume's down, whether you're downstairs in the heads or whatever, your alarm's gonna, on your boat's gonna start pinging very loudly. Versus if I just go Mayday, maybe some, or maybe a good percentage of people don't hear me. So despite the fact there are relatively few DSC Mayday calls, personally, for me, if I'm in that situation, I will always want to remember to go red button push distress because it's my belt and braces. It's shouting as loudly as it's possible to shout, I need assistance. And then you back it up with voice mode. I suppose a negative though of DSC would be battery life uh, because it, the, the, the yeah. house doing more things. That's a good point. Uh, so in the fixed set, it doesn't make any difference, but on the handheld, so personally I use an ICOM M73, I think it is, um, and the battery life is stupendous. It doesn't have DSC. Um, so all it's doing is listening or transmitting. So if I press the button, it eats the battery, but I don't talk on it that often. The DSC versions of these, um, because they're capturing your GPS position on an ongoing basis, the battery life tends to be less. So they tend to be slightly bigger um, because they've got more stuff inside them, and the battery life tends to be less good. We're seeing loads of kayakers and small boaters buying these as their primary means of issuing distress. An absolutely great decision. Decision on that part. If you're if you've got a fixed set in your boat and it's DSC, I'll be tempted almost maybe to have a non-DSC one so the battery life is longer on the other way. It, it, there's no right or wrong with it. It sort of pays your money and takes your choice. So another um, factor of um, having a VHF on board, um, you'll need a um, an operator's license or a, um, uh, a ship's portable radio license. Can you talk us through the sort of Ofcom and have, and there's always up. There's also RWA training, isn't there, specifically for um, radios? Yeah. So for some years, uh, the license for your handheld or your fixed is free. All you do is go onto the Ofcom website, go through the process, you get a license for your boat, sorted. Um, in terms of the operator, basically on the boat there needs to be a qualified operator, but anyone can use the radio on the boat under the guidance of the qualified operator. So, for example, in a family situation, I might have one person come along and do the course, but I want that person to then get the kids or their partner, training them up on how to use the VHF, and they shouldn't hesitate to do that. Um, so they come along, they do a one-day course, which can be classroom or online, they do a test at the end of it, and they get issued with their lifetime operator's certificate. Uh, so it's the, it's the marrying of that operator's qualification with the boat license that makes everything uh, totally legal. Uh, yeah, great. And you, you mentioned uh, that with the DSC, it, it gives more information. It gives a, a, a that long of where that, that distress is coming from. Um, but it also has the MMSI number. What, yes, the MMSI, is a, the, the MMSI is a maritime mobile service identity. So it's like it's a unique nine-digit number. Um, and basically, it stays with the radio forever, so it doesn't follow you around like your phone number can do. Um, and basically, you get that number by registering the radio with Ofcom, and they issue you that number. You type it in. You've only got one chance to generally put it in. Um, so if you get it wrong, you're going to have to take the radio or the boat uh, to a dealer to actually get the um, 
number stripped out. And the reason for that is what they don't want is little Johnny coming along and going, let's put Tom's MMSI number in this distress and let's put Hugo's MMSI number of distress. So it actually locks it down to make it you know, secure in that respect. But basically, get them from Ofcom, they're free, put them into the radio, job done. And when you do your um, uh, Ofcom license, you can also put details, can't you, of your boat, the um, colour, the, the kit that's on board. So it gives the Coast Guard a bit more of a picture of the boat. Mm -hmm. than Absolutely. And that is really key because um, the more information the Coast Guard have, you know, it's, it's again coming back to these insurance policies again. It's a little investment of time at the outset. You know, hopefully you never, ever need it. But the one time you want the Coast Guard to know that your boat is white hull, blue top sides, tends to have a red canvas top, tends to be four people on board, and tends to be boating in this location, is the time when you're really up against it and you, you want them to find you quickly. Yeah. Okay, cool. So um, our, our safety kit is is slowly growing. Um, the next thing uh, which you probably want on board, especially if you're doing uh, longer trips, is is a, in an EPUB. Can you... Um, Tell everybody what, what an EPUB is and yeah, what's its use on board. So that's um, that's one of the ones I've got uh, for, for our boats. Um, it's an electronic position indicating radio beacon. They've been around for a few years now. Uh, but the first one I had was sort of about that big, and now they're down to about that big. And this has got a 10-year battery life. Mm. So it cost me, I think, about 350 quid, 10-year battery life, 35 quid a year. It's a bit of a no-brainer. Who should buy one though? If you go boating, Paul Harbour and approaches or similar, I wouldn't. I wouldn't spend the money on it. Handheld VHF will get you the assistance you need. You're starting to do longer passages. You're in maybe a less populated area of the boating world, west coast of Scotland, round Ireland, that sort of stuff. Um, and you want to be a bit more belts and braces in terms of what you've got. And basically, the way an EPUB works is they can be automatically deployed from a housing. They can automatically set off within the water, or you can manually deploy them. And they basically, when you switch them on, satellites initially start to calculate the position of this piece of kit um, to a rough area of about 28 square miles. And then the GPS unit in it boots up and that position comes down to about 0 0.03 square miles. And at the same time, it's sending up something to the satellites called a hex ID, which is the unique ID. Um, and that then identifies it to you and they know who your emergency contacts are and what sort of boat you're usually on. Etc. Etc. Really, you know, for the in the right situation, absolutely great investment. Yeah, I've I've only ever had to use one once on the west coast of Ireland. I was uh, racing a thirty-six foot Fabio Butzi rib, and it was a, a fantastic bit of kit for going into a head sea. But in a following sea, it was really quite a tricky boat. It was very long and narrow, and we had some big overfalls. And uh, I tipped the nose in and sort of went through the, the next following wave. Um, filled the boat up and carried on going. You know, we, we kept on racing. But about 10 miles later, um, uh, the electronics started to fail in the boat and water ingress into the into the bilges and everything. So um, eventually the boat, was, the boat had died. Um, after spending half an hour trying to get fuel pumps to work and various bits to get the boat trying to get going again, um, with no luck, with no comms and pretty much everything soaked, um, and quite a way offshore, um, after sort of trying to do everything that we possibly could in a safe manner, the only option really was to use an EPUB. And it's the only time I've ever used it, but in about 20 minutes, there was a, a Coast Guard helicopter above us, and shortly afterwards, uh, an RNLI tow back into uh, Kilobex. Um, but uh, so it shows that these things can be extremely useful in the, in the right um, circumstances. Uh, would you say... Um, though that they have to be stowed in the right way absolutely they have to be where you stow them is really a function of your boat and that's about you know, bringing a lot of this safety kit together in grab bags where it's easy to pick up and go with you out of the boat uh we had one um you mentioned west coast of ireland when we were doing round island and it's i think it must have been bouncing around in the locker but i had a call from the coast guard saying there's an epurb going off in your area is it you mm. but no we'll go and start to have a look 10 minutes later they call back and said there's the EPUB's going off, it's got a German hex ID. Is it something to do with you lot? And we had some German boats, so it probably was. So we went and found it. And they could, they, we were just finding it, and they called back and said, right, the lat long is where you are. It is you. Um, and we found this one that was just kicking off under a seat. The only way we could stop it was unscrew the battery, take it out, put it back together again. And so you do need to look after them. Um, if it does go off accidentally, there's no take the battery out, put it in, 
put it in the locker and hope it all goes away. You need to fess up, get on the on the VHF to the Coast Guard and tell them what has happened uh, because potentially they're launching lifeboats and helicopters at that stage. Yeah, and um, I suppose also we've we've had a situation where we were um, Pavo and Rip were loaned uh, a rib and it had a, an EPA uh, attached to the transom, but it was in like a, a very light plastic sort of leisure mm-hmm. yachting bracket. Um, a couple of hours into a big seaway and looking behind and there's an EPUB smashing itself around in the transom. Um, so like you say, you know, having it stowed in the right way and accessible, but, you know, in a way that's not going to be going off in inverted and, um, because, you know, chances are if you're doing 20, 30 knots and you're in a bit of a seaway, you're not going to necessarily know that something's going off and, um, you know, causing, causing havoc for the Coast Guard, are you? Well, we, we had a lifeboat, a life raft rather go out of the back of the boat, didn't notice it was there until we, uh, uh, so at the EPA, you certainly wouldn't notice. <laughs> okay, so uh, also, moving from an EPA to a, a smaller version, a mini EPA or a PLP, um, uh, we'll also move on to AIS shortly, but a PLP, what's the advantage of a, a PLP and how is that different to an EPA? So this is basically a mini version of this. So this is really a boat EPIRB and this is a person EPIRB. We, we give it that generic term of personal locator beacon. But it's all like, tender. We'll, we'll call it for now a mini EPIRB just to differentiate it from the AS version in a moment. And basically, uh, you wear it on your person. Um, so there's no point having this unless it's in your life jacket. So you mentioned spin lock life jackets. So I've got a spin lock life jacket. They do pouches. I've got one just here to the left of where the, the bladder is. And it's in there. It's attached with a lanyard. Um, and um, despite the fact I'm not very good at reading instructions, I've read the instructions a few times now, such that in the hope that if I ever need to use it, I won't be going, what does that say? Um, So the idea is you take it out. On the top of this one, there's a little red bit. We pull that, and an aerial will come out the top, Um, and we will need to be manually deploying this. There's not an automatic deployment feature, and we will need to really rest it on our chest with the antenna element this bit seeing the sky and if that can't see the sky it's most probably not going to work um it will have some little lights flashing like we, we, we talked about before andy on round island being in the water with one of these it seems so, like it seems like all accidents happen in ireland on this <laughs> on this call but yeah they, they did tom that was entirely correct <laughs> it increased it increased my number of lifeboat calls uh, quite exponentially those two weeks <laughs> um, but um it flashes and it beeps, and the question is, what do those flashes and beeps mean? And I think one of the things he quite understandably didn't know was, does that mean they pick me up or not? There's a newer versions now that actually do confirm back to you that the Coast Guard's actually picked up your signal. So the latest 2020 versions do that, which is a pretty good feature. And, of course, a PLB needs to be registered with the Coast Guard, doesn't it? It belongs to you, so you shouldn't be handing it out to, to other people and friends to be borrowing. Yes, you can register. We've got some that are registered to the school. Um, we've got others that are registered to individuals. And I think, you know, a good rule of thumb now is if you're a boater that's boating at night, longer offshore passages, as some of the more um, sort, of, um, sort of enthusiastic rib users are, you know, 180 quid, a five-year battery life, 30 quid a year insurance policy, it's a bit of a no-brainer now. Yeah. Um, so um, AIS... Um, you can have obviously your personal handheld IS devices. How is that different to a PLP? Yeah, so we've got both here. So we've got this one is an AIS locator beacon, a personal locator beacon that bases itself on AIS, this one EPA. So we'll put that one to one side. So what's different about this? So this, you can fit them in your life jacket such that they automatically deploy if you go into the water. So that's a big benefit over the other one. And the way these, these don't send a signal to the Coast Guard, they basically create a signal that's visible probably within a sort of three to seven mile range of where you are in the water. Um, and they will appear or something will appear on the chart plotter screen of any other boat with AIS. And that's saying there's a distress which will go be a person in the water at that place. That's great. That presupposes that someone looking at their chart plotter actually understands what on earth they're looking at, um, because I suspect most ledger boaters would never have seen one. Most commercial boaters probably would never have seen one. So you, there's a bit of a fingers crossed that someone looking at that screen knows what they're looking at. But what they're brilliant for is if you were doing going back to your, you know, your 
uh, your powerboat racing thing and maybe you've got a couple of back seats and there's a danger that someone gets pinged out the back, potentially this goes off, alarms on the chart posture of the boat and then allows you to hone back in on the person on the water. So I think the real fun at the moment, sorry Tom. No, no, no I was just going to say um, that I suppose that's really handy for uh, night passages, isn't it? Because if somebody does go in for yeah. you, you can really night hone and also where you're so far offshore that frankly you need rescuing from the boat you were on rather than necessarily by the coast guard because if you're if you're really at the extremes of say uk search and rescue um then you've got a lot of time in the water that you might not survive so my rule of thumb is that tells the coast guard to come and rescue you so that's the one i buy if i'm on a boat where i might fall off it that tells the boat to come and find me so different slightly similar products but different doing different jobs. Yeah, there was a, a, an ocean sailor, uh, Pip Hare, I think it is, that said that she uh, was sailing uh, across the Dutch coast. Um, somebody's uh, personal AIS uh, device went off accidentally. Um, but also, almost immediately, three vessels that were in the vicinity um, notified the Coast Guard, and then one of them radioed in that, um, to see if it was their vessel that had the issue. So it does, for that, that localised... Um, beacon is really useful isn't it and i think i suspect the people that called it in were probably commercial operators on bigger ships as well with dedicated watches on the bridges and i think that's and where she was boating by the sound it was a very busy boating location um so that helped so i'm not it, they're really good and i think what i'd like to see and my understanding is it's not too many years away now is a unit that combines both has the EPIRB and the AIS in the same unit because then you've got the best of both worlds. Yeah, that would make really practical sense. I suppose um, the next sort of thing that we all carry on us is our, our mobile phones. Um, how can this be useful to have on board if there's a, a, a distress? Well, the, there's been many times I've spoken to the Coast Guard when VHF comms undoubtedly is preferred because that's the primary means of issuing distress of votes. That's the way that uh, it's a broadcast mechanism, VHF, so everybody can hear your comms. But actually, the comms are not always great on VHF and mobile. Can be great. I've had a full 4G connection 14 miles offshore. Um, so sometimes, actually, the ability to get a really good phone signal where your VHF signal is a bit weak, you know, it's, it's an alternative. But the thing is, um, it doesn't, they're not designed to work necessarily in a water based environment, whereas the VHFs are. Um, there are obviously far less uh, antennas in the sea than there are on land, uh, there are a few along the edge of the land, but that can limit their effectiveness and the ability of the Coast Guard to be able to work out exactly where you are. Now things are moving on and phones have the ability to transmit latitude and longitude, their position to the emergency services. Um, but VHF is always going to be a preference, but your phone undoubtedly, make sure it's charged, make sure it's in a waterproof container, um, <clears throat> make sure it's on your person. Yeah, and I think... Uh... There's a, an independent study that says that um, across the UK, networks can have up to an 18-mile nautical range um, offshore. Uh, I'm not so sure about that. I've had a couple many times. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to rely on it, put it that way. Yeah, exactly. But one useful tip that I didn't actually know um, was that even if your um, phone shows no service, um, you can still try calling 999 or 112 anyway because being an emergency phone call, it enables, it goes across all networks. So if you're on Vodafone and Vodafone doesn't have any signal in an emergency uh, situation, it will try across every network available. So that's one useful tip, I suppose. Well, well, another tip actually from a mobile phone point of view is one of the most, arguably one of the most important phone numbers I've got in my phone is direct through to the ops room at Southern Coast Guard. Uh, because it, wherever I'm in the world, if I need rescuing, I know Solon's going to do a good job to doing it. Um, and in other countries, sometimes search and rescue facilities are not, we're, we're so lucky around the coast of Ireland and the UK that we've got amazing lifeboats, Coast Guard, helicopter resources. That's not the case everywhere else. So the ability actually um, to get back to UK search and rescue, um, and then I, I, there's some people I know who have had first-hand experience of, texting their friend in a pub in the UK who called the Coast Guard, who called the Caribbean Coast Guard, who got them effecting the search and rescue down off the Caribbean island that previously they weren't responding to the, the distress call about. Um, so that phone number could be really key. Um, staying with phones, uh, the ROA have got their own app, haven't they, which is invaluable. It's, it's a really useful tool and it works in conjunction with the Coast Guard. Can you tell us a bit yeah. about that? 
So it's called the Safe Tracks app. It's available actually in quite a few countries. I know it's used in South Africa um, and elsewhere, and it's free, no cost and no downside to it. Um, you need to sort an OA account out, but it's just like setting up any other account. You don't need to be a member, uh, but you download the app, um, have it on your phone, and then basically the way to use it is as your sure contact. So when we go out boating, someone should know where we're going. And historically, people have either just told their mates or they told someone or they told no one or they've called the Coast Guard um, and registered that passage over the HF. So SafeTrack gives an alternative option, which is you literally go into the app, you say, I'm here, I'm going to here, I expect to get here at such and such time, this is what I'm doing, this is the boat I'm on, and this is how many people I'm on. And then you crack on and it tracks your passage when you're within range of 3G, 4G. Um, and when you get the other end, you say, I'm here. But if you're running late getting there, the sure contact that it has alerted was to get a message that says, Tom's running late. Could you just try contacting him and see if you're up? <laughs> yeah, they, they probably won't contact you for an hour or two, but after a couple of hours, they'll contact you. Yeah. Um, and then if that person then goes to the Coast Guard and said, look, Tom's gone missing, I can't get a hold of him, the Coast Guard can, under certain circumstances, dial into that app and get positional information from the app. Um, there is also a distress button within it, uh, which I haven't tried, uh, but contacts the Coast Guard direct from the app as well. And there are various other little benefits in there in terms of checklists for your boating and uh, details of various different places around the coast of the UK and Ireland. So good app, totally free, replaces the UK CG66 scheme, which was a form we used to fill in to say, this is my boat, this is what it looks like. If you need to come and rescue me, you've got this information. That's now dealt with through the Safe Tracks app. So rather than calling the Coast Guard and logging your passage plan for the day, um, you, th this is an alternative. Yeah, so what we, we do from a school point of view is we get all of our instructors now to use it for every time they go into the water as a means actually to show students how it's actually used. Um, when we go out socially, we do it. Uh, but if I'm doing a passage where, so I came, I bought a boat uh, from the Solent a couple of days ago, um, so then I contacted the Coast Guard in part so they knew I wasn't a leisure user. Uh, but... I, I sort of figure if the Coast Guard's not busy, so if it's not a busy Saturday in the summer when they've got more than enough to do, actually, in fairness, they're quite happy to actually take a passage from us. So I'll actually call up and register the passage and then uh, contact them again when I'm there. So it could be a mixture of the Coast Guard, a family contact, safe tracks. You've got different tools all doing much the same job. Okay, cool. Um, obviously, with um, the changes in lockdown happening and um, from, from tomorrow onwards, uh, people be uh, looking and investigating going on the water over the next couple of weeks, hopefully. Um, when when they do that and it's safe to do so, what would be your sort of top safety tips for getting back on the water? I suppose also a lot of these boats are going to be winterized a lot longer this year. Um, so there's, there's obviously some key things that they need to be thinking about this time around. Yeah. I think uh, the words perfect storm spring readily to mind. Um, there's the marinas here in, in Dorset and Hampshire are just starting to open up as of really today. People are interpreting it as find it on the water as of tomorrow. And I think the OA supported that as well. Uh, so I think it's going to get very busy. And what's going to happen is boats are going to go out that haven't been run for a while um, and fail for various different reasons. So what can you do? Go with a mate. Go with someone who can tow you back in, albeit only if they're competent to do so. Just go for a short potter where you're not going to get into trouble rather than a 20 mile passage along the coast to a, you know, a lovely bay, but one where if you get into trouble, you're in bigger trouble than you need to be. So I think it's about just a bit of common sense and just reining enthusiasm back in a little bit to just build up because generally people start boating about February or March and that builds up through the Easter holidays. We're going to get a ton of people doing it at once. Um, and that's true of paddleboarders, kayakers, kayak surfers, the RNLI, independent lifeboats are expecting things to be extremely busy. And you've got to bear in mind they're volunteers that cannot socially distance uh, when they're trying to, you know, so you might be socially distanced in your family group on your boat, but if someone has to come and tow you, potentially they're compromising their own safety by doing that. You know, we know people are going to go afloat, that's absolutely fine, but just, just temper that enthusiasm a bit um, and make sure things are, are running right. You're logging your passages, you've got your safety kit, you check through everything. And um, if stuff does start to go wrong, call the Coast Guard early. Uh, so the Coast Guard wants to know as soon as possible because then they'd rather start to get the assets moving um, than actually get to a far more serious situation where life is a more risk later. 
And I think also just practi practical things on board. Um, you've got your safety kit, you've got maybe a tool kit. Um, fuel filters can get um, clunked up, can't they? Uh, batteries can be failing. And um, so there's things where the boats maybe stood still for a lot longer. And yeah, you, you don't want to be complacent and putting um, uh, lives at risk by um, not not being sensible before we, yeah, we, we head out onto the water. No, no one goes out there with the intention to get rescued, uh, but it's, um, from the number of people that are rescued each year, um, then obviously that caught a number of people unawares. So just try and not be one of those statistics insofar as um, it's just it, it's just exacerbating all of the current problems if you become part of that as well. If you do, that's fine. Don't hesitate to call for assistance. Stuff happens, not a problem. The RNI, the independent lifeboats, would be more than happy to come and assist. But if you can't avoid it, do avoid it. Okay. Paul, I think that's a good session for today. And um, so thank you for your, your wealth of knowledge and, and, and guidance for all of our viewers. Um, we're going to try and do another one, I think, next week on, on Monday um, in the evening this time to um, uh, cover off on a, a, another uh, training or safety aspect of, of boating. But um, thank you, Paul, for yeah, your time this afternoon. Um, for the rest of our viewers, um, please make sure that you like and subscribe to our uh, PBR TV YouTube channel and our Facebook page. It's where we'll be updating all of the content and the topics that Paul and I and others will be um, covering up on. And um, we're also, um, for this year, doing a free digital subscription of uh, PBR. So if you jump onto powerboatandrib.com, um, there you can um, take advantage of the free digital uh, subscription. And it's got loads of uh, unique fit features um, like uh, digital pop-outs and videos, etc. of that. Paul's website is on the screen now at powerboat-training-uk-co.uk. Um, so if you've got any specific questions for Paul, then I'm sure he'll happily take your, your uh, phone call. But thanks uh, for everybody watching and uh, tune in again next week where we'll have another live session with Paul. Thanks so much.